questions in just a moment. First, I want to thank Bitmax for participating in our webinar series. Uh, they've been great supporters of OTTX, supporting many of our events and as active members of discussion sessions and working groups. So thank you, Bitmax. Um, I know we're all looking forward to their presentation today and the discussion uh, entitled, Will Skip Theatricals Be the New Norm for Independent Filmmakers? With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim and Jay from Bitmax. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. So thanks to the entire OTTX team this morning uh, for getting this set up. Um, I'm reminded by your introduction uh, about just how far we've come since we first distributed that VOD asset to Time Warner and Comcast back in 2001. Certainly couldn't have been imagined talking about this topic today, uh, nearly 20 years uh, since. But uh, we are making progress. I uh, wanted to uh, welcome everyone for joining us today as we explore a trend uh, that we've all noticed well before our new social distancing reality. Over the past several years, and especially within this one, the world of film distribution has seen some seismic shifts. Some that will change how filmmakers produce, partner, market, and reach audiences in the future. So for those of you who don't know, Bitmax is a managed services provider serving a broad set of content owners, filmmakers, and platform partners from Apple to Comcast to 2B TV. As advocates for our clients, part of our job is to help navigate, guide distribution efforts, and help optimize ROI. Consequently, we have a vested interest in how this shifting landscape all plays out. To help them, we built a media orchestration tool named Maestro, which drives workflows and tracks multiple PVOD, TVOD, SVOD, and ABOD assets across digital platforms globally. So when I initially drafted an article for Mason Q1, theaters were still operating. But back in 2019, Jay and I were seeing a definitive trend among indie film partners, rethinking distribution, including skipping the theatrical window altogether. In the ensuing months, the pandemic and stay-at-home orders had impacted not only theaters, but halted production and development deals, and the ecosystem had to adapt. Since then, most of us have to as well, and, and we have. A simplified visual of historical movie windows highlights the sequential and the distinct revenue buckets, all starting with the objective of releasing theatrically. Knowing that a great theatrical run could impact the film's revenue potential as it worked its way through the subsequent windows. And one way to do that, of course, was to have great run at film festivals. As we've all seen over time, many of these traditional windows have shifted and or become simultaneous as with day and date. The shift from physical to digital, the adoption of streaming, the explosion of SVOD, it's all impacted those windows, some meaningfully. For instance, at least initially, many of our indie filmmakers saw the rise of SVOD as a boom. Great new content was being produced, but over time, Netflix acquired less and created more originals. Filmmakers, especially independents, needed new ways to preserve already slim margins, much less grow new ones. More recently, of course, we've seen the impact of COVID-19 on release dates across the board. Festivals canceled, theaters shuttered, underscoring the need to help film partners pivot. S5 consumption has soared, virtual theatrical bridges were constructed, PVOD gained greater popularity, the workarounds were well underway. Even before the pandemic, we'd begun working with our partners to take advantage of growing TVOD, PVOD, SVOD, and the burgeoning AVOD opportunities coming online. And while there's no simple recipe, we adopted new strategies to help reach audiences and aggregate revenue across the many sources. We've obviously only included a small sampling here, but the multi-platform, multi-model distribution path was taking shape. My son reminds me that there's perhaps a silver lining of the recent shutdowns. It's been the reemergence of drive-ins, uh, including those in backlots. But even they are not immune to the forces of change. This year, many temples like Trolls World Tour, Capone, High Note, and more recently Scoob, all saw direct to VOD releases. While the Lovebirds went straight to Netflix and Greyhound was delayed with its distribution rights eventually sold to Apple. 
The movie industry has, and continues to, and will, undergo dramatic changes to adapt to the current disruptive shutdowns. As many of you know, some of this shift was well underway before the coronavirus struck, and the impact will be felt well beyond. So back on June 12th, the big summer release date, including Artemis Fowl, Defy Bloods, and King of Staten Island, Screen Rant reported that the timing of these releases might also prove to be significant as movie theaters are geared up to reopen. And I quote, most major theater chains appear to be on track to be open by mid-July. Well, that didn't happen here, but it can be argued that for some films like King of Staten Island, it's the shift to PVOD that may have been just the ticket. Oh, that was a pun, yeah, and it was intended. Um, late last year, an indie film partner, Takuli Productions, decided to pursue a digital TVA debut. Similarly, Viking Films Truth, which debuted just yesterday, made the decision to forego the theatrical route. Of course, hindsight's 2020, but it wasn't that obvious back when they were evaluating the marketing and distribution strategy months ago. This spring, facing stay-at-home orders and shuttered theaters, the final fix hit the digital platforms across the globe. Producer Norman Stone was thrilled to learn his doc would still be able to reach audiences at home and on digital platforms almost everywhere. On the flip side, at least one well-known Hollywood exec remains determined to have his film Tenet debut only in theaters. He'd ultimately delayed his US release, so he shifted some international dates, and since then, Tenet has garnered accolades and theater share, at least in the UK. But what box office receipts it can garner with limited social distance seating in theaters is still TBD. Some writers suggest the recent ruling striking down the Paramount decrees will impact movie diversity. And it does highlight ecosystem changes that impact how films make their way to audiences in the US, another TBD. In related news, AMC is offering 15 cent movie tickets for one day tomorrow to celebrate its 100th anniversary. So assuming you can find an AMC open, uh, theater open, you should uh, perhaps try that. Last week's announcement that we all saw that Disney would shift its release of Mulan to Disney Plus is interesting from a number of perspectives. Disney had already spent the majority of its Mulan marketing budget, and with the early success of Disney Plus, perhaps it was an obvious choice. But it's got many wondering whether this may be a bellwether, and others declaring Peabod's finally here to stay. Yet this Disney Peabod is a new twist on premium VOD. Disney decided to execute this Peabod as an opt-in transactional offering within their SVOD service. So embedding a transactional PVOD title this way, somewhat novel. In its relatively young history, PVOD has generally followed the TVOD model with broad distribution across numerous third-party transactional platforms from Apple to Google to Voodoo to the MVPDs. So will those platforms eventually get a bite at the Mulan Apple? Will we see other studios with their own SVOD services follow suit? And what does this mean for the box office metric? It's long driven valuations, awards, accolades for film properties. Is this a retention tool, catch and play, or perhaps maybe a new model altogether? Whoops. Well, apparently, Disney doesn't think so, at least not in Bob's initial public statements. And yes, we're on a first name basis. So uh, while the economics are still being digested and debated, at least some say, this may be the beginning of another big shift in our industry. Advocates for PVOD are predicting this for years, notably following Comcast's acquisition of Universal. It may be too early to reach any firm conclusions, and I will most definitely leave that to others to discuss and debate. And with that, we're gonna jump right into the conversation. I'll introduce Jay, who's gonna introduce our super smart, well-connected panel to kick off our discussion. Thanks again. Thanks, Jim. Colin Dixon is the founder of Screen Media and a prominent industry veteran. We'll drive a discussion with some smart executives who are not only dealing with this dynamic environment, but they're shaping it. Colin and our film partners will help make sense of this and industry developments. Our partners come from segments of the movie ecosystem, each with unique insights into filmmaking, packaging, and distribution. They'll share their perspectives on the changes we're seeing in the marketplace. We have a great panel. Kristen Harris leads acquisition and distribution at Good Deed Entertainment. She oversees all aspects of the country, uh, company's distribution arm, and manages the release slate, 
which includes Extraordinary, Journey's End, Spirit Award nominated uh, nominee to Dust, <clears throat> and the Academy Award nominated Loving Vincent. She's got some okay. great insights. Okay. I want to interrupt yeah. you here. I'm sorry. Uh, it looks like you're still muted. So why don't we unmute you? There we go. Okay. Uh, so let's, should I start again? Can you hear me now? Yeah, why don't you just briefly um, introduce Colin and, and Kristen. Thanks. All right. Redo. Uh, we have a great panel. Um, and thanks, Jim. Colin Dixon is the founder of Screen Media and a prominent industry veteran who will drive a discussion with some smart executives who are not only dealing with this dynamic environment, but who are shaping it. Colin and our film partners will help make sense of this and other industry developments. Our partners come from different segments of the movie ecosystem, each with unique insights into filmmaking, packaging, and distribution. They're gonna share their perspectives on the changes we're seeing in the marketplace. Kristen Harris leads acquisition and distribution at Good Deed Entertainment. She oversees all aspects of the company's distribution arm and manages the release slate, which includes Extraordinary, Journey's End, Spirit Award nominee to Dust, and the Academy Award nominated Loving Vincent. She's got some great insights, especially around her work supporting virtual theatricals. And if you haven't seen it already, carve out some time for Lucky Grandma, which is currently a top 10 indie film on Apple. Jason Beck is another well-known industry veteran, also known as Beck. He's the co-founder of the Film Arcade. He's been involved with some terrific films over his career. And as you'll see, Beck has a remarkably quick wit and some great ideas on where this industry has been and likely headed. Kurt Eftikar, finally, We've invited our partner, Kurt, owner of Area 23A Films, an event-based theatrical distribution company who partnered with us to bring a wicked cool new title by legendary filmmaker Louis Schwartzberg to premium VOD. He's gonna share how they shifted their plans from theatrical, which they began, uh, and then COVID happened, uh, to On Demand, where uh, Fantastic Fungi, recently attained the number one documentary spot on Apple. It's there for about two, at least two weeks now. We're super proud of that. It's a really cool movie. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Colin. Thank you very much, Jay. And I'd like to invite Kristen to join me. Uh, th there you are, and you're unmuted. Kristen, welcome. Yeah. Um, hi. <laughs> Tell us about, uh, first of all, why don't, you, why don't you give us a quick introduction to Good Deed Entertainment, Pant Out Film. Sure, uh, so Good Deed Entertainment has two arms. Uh, Good Deed Entertainment, which is our more traditional art house distribution production label and Cranked Up Films, um, where we focus on genre leaning content. Uh, we distribute about 10 to 12 films per year. Uh, we're really a boutique theatrical leaning entity. Um, so, I mean, we really lean into being very high touch, um, creating bespoke campaigns um, for our, our films and our filmmakers. Um, and even though we're not in the business of wide releasing, we're very much in the business of niche theatrical releasing. So that component is really important to us in, in what we do. Uh, even if we're not on several thousand screens, uh, we still really hold the, the idea that, that some uh, some level of theatrical exposure is beneficial to all of our campaigns. So it, it has been an interesting time dealing with these collapsing windows and playing with new theatrical or virtual theatrical models. So walk us through what happened before, before the middle of March, of course, you were 100% focused on the theatrical market, or at least primarily focused on the theatrical market. And then all the theaters closed in March. So walk us through what happened to your business and the movies that you had uh, in theaters and, and coming to theaters in, in this window, what was to what happened there? 
Sure. Um, so we actually caught ourselves right in the middle of the theatrical closures. We had a, a really fantastic, well-reviewed um, Black comedy called Extraordinary that had opened well um, in a handful of theaters that was, you know, we had done a partnership, launch partnership with the Alamo Draft House chain, and we were just into week two expanding our footprint, expanding our reach. We had great per screen averages, you know, all the things that you, you want and are looking for in a traditional theatrical window. And then suddenly two weeks in, everything was closed. Um, and we had then a, an additional two and a half months to really figure out what are we going to do with this film before we hit our traditional street date. Um, at, at that point, all of the other films that were in that window with us were scrambling to obviously move up their EST or transaction, transactional street dates. Being an in indie, we didn't have quite as much leverage as some of the traditional studios, nor did I want to go exactly toe to toe with, you know, Invisible Man and some of those bigger studio movies. Um, we, we looked at what some of our peers were doing and we caught wind of what was happening with this virtual theatrical model. Um, and we took a chance, quite honestly. We're a small company, we're able to pivot pretty quickly. So within about another week, we pivoted over to a virtual theatrical only model, um, which theaters were just beginning to adopt. We had partnered with a platform run by, by Kino Lober called Kino Marquee. Um, however, we will still we were still responsible for handling all of our bookings. So I think in the first week we're in, we were in about 50 to 100 theaters, I think all in. We played an additional 200, 250 sites um, at a premium price point of, of $12. So it's still a technically a theatrical rental. Um, and we saw some really strong revenues coming out of it. Look, it's definitely not apples to apples with traditional theatrical. Absolutely. I, I, I'd say that like if success in, in traditional box offices is in the millions, I'd say success in the virtual theatrical world is in the, the hundreds of thousands, more likely. Um, data is still early. The people are still figuring out what, what this is, if they want to experiment with it. We're still figuring out what this is. We're figuring out and getting exhibition on board with it. But right now we were we were in a position where we had really nothing to lose than to try to try something different to monetize. We ended up having really strong, you know, financial success with it. It um, was something that Apple and Amazon and all the traditional ch transactional players were, were in theory fine with exhibition playing in their trans transactional rental sandbox um, because tickets had to be purchased through those theaters and the ex exhibition was still sharing in the revenue. So it's still a traditional rev share model between distributor and exhibitor. Um, and yeah, so I mean, we've, we then went on to, to frankly, like, let's get it while the getting's good. There are no other big studio films coming out at the moment. So we saw a window of opportunity. We had a traditional art house theatrical plan for later that summer called Lucky Grandma, which is another really fun sort of black comedy heist film um, set in Chinatown in New York. We saw a window, we pivoted and, and moved Lucky Grandma up to May for a clean, traditional, virtual only theatrical. And we're like, look, let's see, let's see what this does. Let's see if there's interest. Let's see how many exhibitors we can get on board and, and let's play with this model as a, a way to have lower cost PA um, and potentially still see upside on transactional. And I think we we really did see that. I, I ironically enough, I think that the the exposure we got and the sort of love we got when we hit our street date um, a couple of weeks ago, um, iTunes, et cetera, really treated us as though we had had a traditional theatrical window, even though our theatrical was online. Um, so yeah, I mean, we really benefited. We we earned the label of editor's choice for for Lucky Grandma, and it, it's it's been a, an interesting rise. I mean, the question now is going to be, what do we do now that theaters are going to slowly start opening, and we're once again going to be competing with the major studios. Right now, indie independent distributors have really had been in the fortunate position to to be sort of almost on par with, with where the, the major studios were in terms of garnering um, merchandising placement and, and sort of love from the transactional platform. So I think a lot of us are trying to release films right now while we can, while there's really a lack of new, fresh, interesting content. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to, to see that perhaps consumers will be more willing to, to sort of look at indie, indie options in the marketplace. So um, I just want to remind our audience, if you have a specific question for Kristen, please enter it in the Q&A window. Um, I will try and squeeze in time for one question at the end of my, my discussion with Kristen. But um, 
um, if, if we don't get to that, maybe I can get to it in the Q&A in the end. Um, so could you give us just a little bit more detail about how virtual, how the virtual release window works, how, how that, the mechanics of that? Sure. So, I mean, the virtual theatrical window right now is fluid. It's not necessarily a clean, clear cut. It has to be 90 days. Sometimes it's 30 days. Sometimes it's a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, there's a number of platforms that are that are sort of hosting the back end of virtual theatrical. Um, Kino Marquee being one of them. Uh, Vimeo On Demand does, does some of it. Film Movement has done some. Um, I know that, you know, Magnet and, and Magnolia are doing their own back end. Um, Essentially, the way this works is that you, as a consumer, um, purchase a virtual ticket through your local art house theater. It's predominantly independent chains that are participating. Um, I think some of the, the largest being the Angelica chain, right? Um, but there's there's a couple, a few hundred independent theaters that are participating. Uh, you buy a ticket at that $12 price point, around the same price point you would buy a ticket for anyway. Um, it's really the only way independent exhibition is earning any revenue right now. And from our perspective, uh, the future of independent exhibition is crucial. Um, we're really concerned about their ability to survive this pandemic. Um, so we as an indie distributor want to play a role in supporting that. Um, and it, once you buy your ticket, you essentially have a code for a five day rental. So there's a number of ways and there's like a little fact sheet as to like, hey, do you screen share onto your TV? Do you watch on your on your desktop? Do you watch on your mobile? There's a number of ways in which you can ultimately um, get the film up on on your device, the device of your choosing. But but the reality is there is still a bit of a learning curve with consumers as to what is this and whether they're willing to take the leap and figure out how right. to set up the technology of virtual theatrical. Right. Um, so just uh, real quickly here, when you think about PVOD, how do you think that PVOD will have, will it have a lasting approach? Uh, uh, impact on your business or do you think when things go back to normal you'll go back to normal the, you know the normal theatrical focus sure. I mean I think that PVOD will have an impact on our business I think that first and foremost I need to have a film and or any any distributor needs to have a film worthy of that PVOD price point right there needs to be meaningful publicity and advertising spent behind it. There needs to be some recognizable stars, some level of recognizable hook for, for consumers to be willing to pay a premium price point. And, and yes, I, I hear the argument that it's still that 1999 Peabot is still cheaper than going to theaters, but that was the same argument made when we launched a day and date. This isn't a new argument. It still has to be a film that people actually want to see rather than them saying, I'm willing to wait 30 days, I'm willing to wait. 60 days to watch this at a, a more affordable price point at home. Right, right. Um, so we've got one, one question um, from Alan M. Thank you, Alan. Do you think platforms like Zoom can be the future of movie theater? We can purchase through Zoom-like platform and view the film with friends at the same time. So viewing parties, can that help, rest can that help restore the theater feel? I think that we, we are looking for ways to, to to revive community. I think what is so special and important and vital about the theatrical experience is that shared experience of sitting in a darkened room with a bunch of strangers watching this, this piece of, uh, piece of cinema. Um, and we're, the reality is we're figuring it out as we go along. Right now is the time for experimentation. Nobody really knows. Um, I do know that in terms of looking for the kind of content that ha that is meaningful, that is curated, I do think there's still, still something really worthwhile about being in the virtual cinema of the Music Box Theater in Chicago or in the Angelica in New York because they do have a dedicated loyal fan base. Yeah. They're very highly curated with the movies they choose to show. So you can only assume that a movie that these theaters are choosing to show, whether in a traditional exhibition setting or a virtual setting, there's still going to be a level of quality um, and they still have a dedicated fan base um, but what we need to recreate right is that 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 community how do we do this together whether it's at Amazon watch party or whether it's zoom I do think that a lot of us are going to be concerned with piracy um, with platforms like zoom it's not just about the the awareness of the platform like look let's be I think we know that Vimeo has has tried to make themselves a transactional platform and, and frankly because of how People, how much people are aware of them, it just does, hasn't worked right. to, the, to the extent that we've, that they, I think, were hoping it would. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kristen, this has been fascinating. Please stick around and join us at the end for the open Q and A. Thank you so much. And next I would like to invite Jason Beck to join me. Jay, uh, Beck, can you, can you turn your video and your audio Uh, on? One. Hey, Colin. Ah, there you are. Very good. So, uh, Beck, why don't you introduce us to the Film Arcade? Yes. Uh, so, the Film Arcade has been around nine years. Um, what started off as uh, predominantly a theatrical distributor has turned into development, production, uh, co-financing, um, you know, um, mainly uh, feature films. And then recently, we got uh, into financing independent television. So... We kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, we're a boutique company. There's about eight of us. Right. Um, but it's, you know, it's all independent production and distribution. So, Very good. So uh, you were pretty much 100% focused on theatrical releases before, before yeah. mid-March, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it, last year we had a couple of films. What we'd like to do is the, uh, call it the, like the art house uh, platform release, sort of what Kristen was saying, open in a couple of theaters. Uh, try to build awareness, whether it's, you know, in-person Q&As with the talent um, and then expanding from there. So that was, uh, yeah, that was our focus. Obviously, with what's happening now, we, we're we kind of doing, you know, kind of switching our plan. Um, and what we're really trying to figure out is how long this will last, um, you know, and try to predict what we should do moving forward. So... Right. So, so let's think what happened, you know, mid, mid March when those theaters closed, how did you begin to reorientate? Because, um, I mean, I don't know how, how long, well, first of all, how long do you think this is going to last realistically, uh, so the theater is going to be impacted and then we can talk about what you're doing yeah, to retool. It's a great question. And you know, the, the quick answer is I obviously don't know, but I do have an opinion. My opinion, um, excluding bigger releases, because I think that will come back quicker um, because there's just a lot more money behind them. Independent theaters, and I, and I hope I'm wrong, I think we're one to two years away from, from it really becoming a viable business again, where you can open a movie, if it does well, you could expand it. Uh, and again, I'm basing it on whether theaters are open or not. Obviously, it's great if they're open, but will people wanna go out of their house and sit in an, an indoor environment for, you know, for two hours. Um, so clearly you can't hold your breath for two years. So we, you have to do something. Um, so, so tell us about how you're beginning to reorient the business to, yeah. to exist in this new world. So what, what we started to do, you know, because we do produce and finance movies, we started reading a lot more and, and just trying to find projects that we could potentially shoot during this time, uh, more kind of contained movies. Um, you know, a little bit on the smaller side because you know you can't really rely a lot of times what we do is we'll make a movie and you know hopefully get into a festival um and and launch it from there but you can't even rely on that anymore so we're we're trying to find contained uh features to make now uh and develop and then you know obviously reading books and just trying to basically trying to prepare for when when this when this ends uh as well as watching a lot of finished films um you know just to see what could potentially could be right for a virtual release. So we've been really trying to kind of build our slate. We, you know, we're, we're a little smaller than Goody. We do about three to four movies a year. Um, so, so do you actually have to, do you physically have to change the type of movies that you're focused on now? Um, because obviously promotion in a pre-COVID world with theater orientation is pretty different to promotion in a post virtual digital world right yeah yeah it's a great question so normally a lot of times pre-covid we'll see a movie and if we really respond to it and think it has something to say whether it has cast or not we we can still buy it and release it and i i would have no problems doing that you know taking the risk and you know you figure out how to do it the right spend the right release strategy now I, i'd be very nervous to do that so i would i would really focus on movies that have cast uh you know it doesn't need to be big cast but it needs to be certain casts that have a following whether you know whether they have a following on social media um you know instagram or what, any of those places because it, it's very hard to reach an audience pre-covid especially with independent film i think it's even harder now if you don't have 
cast that has kind of a built-in yeah. following. And um, so that, that's really been our focus. Yeah, that is one of the things that the digital suddenly confronts us all with, right? Because suddenly you have to shout louder than folks like Netflix or Disney releasing a Mulan or it becomes really difficult to grab attention, right? Yeah, very difficult. You know, we, anything we're looking at, we know, you know, normally we'll, we'll hire a PR company and bring them on eight weeks uh, earlier, but now I would even bring them on like 12 to 16 weeks earlier and really kind of really spend the money and do, you know, as much work um, as early as possible to kind of build that kind of, you know, core audience and try to build word of mouth uh, before the before the the film comes out. Now, obviously, for you, um, well, and Kristen, and and uh, of course for Kurt, the local theaters are really critical. Um, how are you? How are you thinking about working with local theaters through this trying time? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's again, like Kristen was saying, the the virtual cinema and supporting supporting the theaters. We, you know. If I don't have any movies scheduled now, but but if I did, maybe I would, you know, work with the theaters and 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 try to do something special for each and every virtual release, um, and yeah, just try to create awareness through that way. It's it's a scary time because the I do know the business will come back, but it's going to come back for those who survive it. So the the hope is it comes back sooner than later, and 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 the theaters can kind of ride out the storm. Right. Um. So I've got one more question for you, and then I'm gonna um, I, I'll, I will ask uh, an audience question. So if you have a question for Beck, please type it into the Q and A window right now. Um, so okay, so let's assume that at some point, oh dear, somebody's turned their microphone off. They could turn that off. Not you, not you, Beck. Don't turn your microphone no. off. Um, uh, could you explain to us how you think some of the things that you're learning now with PVOD? might persist beyond the beyond the recovery when theaters are fully open yeah it's so i i love virtual cinema i know it's just kind of coming together now and i've talked to a bunch of different distributors and some of them are mixed on the kind of geo filtering so i you know because i i called a couple people yesterday and i said when you do virtual cinema is it available for anyone and a lot of them said it is except certain theaters during some of their early releases, asked for it to be kind of geo-filtered. So I, you know, I, I have my own opinion. It would be great if it was only available to, you know, the people in within a certain mile radius. Um, you know, obviously you want everyone to be able to see the movie, movie, but it would be great if we started off for a week or two where it was just available to that independent theater circuit. Um, and maybe that could potentially it's not going to replace the theatrical, but at least it's something that not everyone has access to. And maybe you could kind of build a community that way. Um, but a lot of people, di you know, have a difference of opinion on that, but that's kind of where I see this going. You know, if we knew today, if we knew today that this was going to last two years, I think that should be what, what movies should be doing. But unfortunately I feel like we don't know. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of experimentation before we kind of, yeah you know, settle on, settle on the right way to do things. One thing I noticed in the chats and, and in the Q and A is people are, people seem to be recognizing how important the film community itself is. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about how you're, you're trying to nurture that community even, even as they're unable to go to the theaters? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it is a challenge and obviously it's, it's more important now than it ever has been before. But, you know, again, just, just, it, the easiest thing to do is obviously through social media and just to try to kind of build awareness that way. But it's, you know, I, I don't think we'll lose, you know, the independent film community, but we're going to have to find ways to keep them engaged. And I, you know, I know a lot of people early on were doing watch parties and, you know, I saw someone had a question about, can it be done through zoom? And, and the quick answer to all that is absolutely. But, what will be the most effective? Um, I, I don't know. I just think we have to try a lot of different things and then um, see what works best and then tailor it to kind of the specific movie. Um, Great. 
Very good. Lots of unknowns now, Colin. That, oh, isn't it just? We're yeah. in, a, we're in yeah. the world of unknowns, indeed. Well, Beck, look, thank you so much. Um, please hang on and rejoin us again when we go to the open Q&A. Uh, okay. Next, I'd like to invite Kurt Eftikar, who's CEO of Area 23A. Kurt, welcome. Um, tell us, first of all, why don't you tell us just a little bit about Area 23A? Sure. Um, we're an event-based distribution company. Uh, we've been around uh, about 10 years. And event bases, we do added value cinema. So we do traditional theatrical, but we do a lot of events. So it's a hybrid model. And um, so we've released films going back to like Revenge of the Electric Car, uh, Glenn Campbell, I'll Be Me, uh, Heal, uh, and then re recently Fantastic Fungi. So we really collaborate with filmmakers. Um, so we're, it's really a partnership. It's not like we're taking over a film. We really work uh, in sync with filmmakers because they know their films best. They've lived with these films, you know, especially with documentaries, five years to 10 years, right? In terms of the journey of, of a film. So we really use our expertise. We tap into kind of their goals of what they're trying to achieve and we bring them to the highest level. So, um, and we work with filmmakers from all over the world. So it's not, you know, from India to uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan <laughs> to LA, there's a full, uh, range of filmmakers that we work with and that's what makes it really interesting because there's a lot of cultural differences a lot of you know but it's the common language of film so let's why don't we talk about fantastic fungi because this is a particularly interesting uh, model situation right because uh, fantastic fungi was actually released before theater closures so can yeah. you talk us through how how it was doing there and what you were doing in the lead up to where those theaters started to close yeah, you know, I mean, the, the film's been really an odyssey. We uh, started the release. Um, I partnered with uh, Moving Art, which is uh, director Louis Schwartzberg's uh, company. And uh, we started in October 2019. And uh, we had a phenomenal run. It became one of the top um, documentaries of the past uh, six, seven months. It did about two and a half million dollars at the box office. and really became um, one of those films that uh, was a word of mouth film. So in other words, without getting into all of the details, because we'd be here for a long time, but it became one of those feel good movies where it, it was an enigma. People were like, what's this film about fungi? What's this film about mushrooms? And so all of the, uh, the press, the kind of grassroots marketing, everything kind of came together where theaters were, you know, really getting the feedback from community saying, this is a film we love. We want more and more people to see it because it has such a positive message. So that journey through to about the COVID time, um, we were just about to do a fantastic fungi day, which was a 500 theater global event. And literally we saw country by country as the COVID. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we had to basically cancel territory by territory. And the crazy thing is each country said, no, no, that's not going to happen to us. And the last country obviously was like New Zealand saying, okay, well, we're going to have to close too. So similar to, the, to, to my colleagues on this call, we all, we basically pivoted into the virtual world because we felt that it was time to offer the film as a way of, because the film's main theme is about interconnecting. It's about networking. It's about bringing people together, learning to live like Mycelium Network Underground. Um, is basically what the above ground world can learn about. So we offered the film, we did some very, we, we essentially copied our, our theatrical release. We brought people together through high added value events online. So we would bring together top speakers, we would have music performances, we would bring back, we would really bring thought leaders together through um, these different types of days. So Fantastic Fungi Day, went from the theatrical world, we unified and brought everyone together in the virtual world. And so um, we then shifted into um, our own Vimeo, uh, basically VOD uh, release, where through our website, we offered the films to, um, to, uh, to the community. And it really, again, it really just was a gratifying experience because not only individuals could purchase the film, but also virtual cinemas participated as well. So it wasn't your standard virtual release. Um, it was kind of a, a hybrid. So we had like individual purchases and then we also had theaters participating, offering their film to their communities because they already had experienced the film in uh, the traditional theatrical world. 
Very good. So, so can you talk a little bit about how you were actually able to reach out to those communities and, and tell them about the digital events? Yeah, I mean, um, well, there, the director, you know, Keith Louis Schwartzberg, uh, you know, spent 13 years um, making this film. So he, wow. uh, yeah, <laughs> that was, you know, unbelievable, uh, just a painstaking process of raising money, building community, finishing the film through um, on the technology side. Um, so there was uh, pre-built communities um, that from the mycology world that had been following this film. So one of the, so our collective team, we built out different types of audience um, groups, whether it's from the psychedelic side, the permaculture side, um, from the environmental side. The film has an incredible message that a lot of people share. And so, again, through strong word of mouth, as people from these different, we call pillars, these different audiences heard about the film, more and more of them wanted to see the film. And so it got to a tipping point where we already knew we had that word of mouth. The transition into the digital world was um, already there. So it wasn't um, just let's start right from scratch in the digital world. We had, you know, a, a really big audience. So, so you, you actually found some continuity between the way you would have, the way you were doing marketing in the theaters and into the digital world. There was some continuity there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the one thing I can say, and I think the way, I, the way my brain operates too is, um, I would say three things. One is I think the theaters, um, are obviously for all distributors are our number one priority. We want the theaters just like us, just as distributors, we all need to survive. And so, but we have to put a lot of hard marketing into it just because we're closed, just because the business has stopped the way we know it doesn't mean our brain stops. So we have to be very uh, creative in the way we think and reaching out to niche audiences. So we really have to know how to connect with them both in the digital space and the theaters also, I think, can learn from distributors as well in terms of how to market to their community. So it's not just sending out an email blast. It really is more than that. It's, it's creating some really innovative ways. So I do a lot of live cinema, like literally it's live cinema. So it's not just, it's not just a film that is, uh, hey, you can rent this anytime you want. It's a live event. So you're watching the film together. You're watching the, the Q&A together. You're all, it's, it's, it's a immersive participatory cinema. And I think that has really um, done well. And um, obviously piracy is, is something that you have to watch out for. So you have to have your DRM encoded on the film so that can protect the film. And um, so, you know, again, it's like, there's no set rules like the, like the previous panelists were talking about. It's a really kind of wild, wild west, but it's fun in a lot of ways because you see what works and what doesn't. And um, screenings can, you know, we've had screenings where 50 people showed up and then you've had, we've had screenings where 2000 people showed up. So it yeah. just really depends on, you know, on the project. Very good. The Very good. So at this point, I'd like everybody please to turn on, turn on your video and turn, all the panelists that is to turn on your video and your microphones and we're going to get into the Q and A here. Um, I've got one last follow up question for, for you, Kurt. Um, will the Peabot approach uh, do you think that will have a lasting impact on your business? Well, did you say with a P or a T? P bot, P bot. Yeah, yeah, with P. Premium, <laughs> premium. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I just didn't hear the P or the T. Sorry. That's okay. Could be um, my accent. You know, again, the way I look at it is, I think it's you know, again, like what we've been talking about, the groups we've been talking about. I think niche. Um, if you look at things like how Discovery started out, or National Geographic, or any of these kind of um, nonfiction um, channels. I think if you have, uh, you know, a high, like Kristen said, if you have a high quality film that um, is, has a built in audience, um, and I know more about the documentary side than, than let's say the feature side, but if you have a built in audience about people who want to watch something about Corvettes and there's like, you know, maybe it's not the best example, but you know, tens of thousands of Corvette owners and they know they can watch it on, in, on Peabot for 20 bucks, and that's the only place they're going to be able to see it. Those diehard fans will pay that money to go see it. But again, it has to be, I think, a really, you know, again, it's not a studio film. It's a, be, we're talking about the independent world. So I think it really just comes down to the kind of content it is. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the PVOD with, um, you know, if theaters are available as well, I think they'll, I think, again, 
And I think they'll go hand in hand. Um, it just it just remains to be seen how you know how they they coexist together. Very good. So so to all of the panelists, I want to ask you what you think about the 17 day window that has been agreed between AMC and Universal. Um, eight, 17 days was spe specifically to give three weekends, three four weekends in the theaters. Is this viable for your businesses? Christine? It's always a tricky question to go on the record about right now, right? Because it's so, <laughs> it's so new and it's such a sensitive, it's such a sensitive topic, particularly for independent exhibition who really counts on that clean 90 day window. Um, and like, look, obviously I want to support exhibition. It's crucial that they, in my mind, that they survive this next year or two. And I agree with what Beck said about, you know, realistically, I think it's going to be close to a year before I, I'm able to execute on a proper traditional theatrical release. Um, from my standpoint, I actually like the idea that, that that window, that there is some flexibility in that window and that it is a, can be potentially a moving model where we can have a little bit of a shorter window because from my standpoint as a distributor, if I have a, say, a really good film, but it takes a little while for it to catch on and I'm releasing only theatrically, if I don't hit a certain, like an amazing per screen average in weeks one or two, suddenly I'm off all my screens, even if I do, you know, moderately well, I just, I don't have the opportunity to, to build sort of word of mouth. If I have a great film that's say a discovery, if it's review driven, um, it's maybe a quieter film. I don't have the ability to get necessarily back on screen. And then I have to figure out what to do over the next two and a half months before I can be available to rent or, or on, you know, EST. Um, so for a lot of independent cinema, it's, you know, there are just certain films that don't necessarily need a full 90 day window. Um, some of them do. It's, it really shouldn't be, it's not a one size fits all. So I do think it's an interesting step forward, but I, I also see some of the dangers in it, particularly for, for art house exhibition. Thank you. But Beck, um, so Alan M asked me, are we trying to hold on to a legacy model theaters in inverted commas, like Codec? held on to film? There's a confrontational question for you. What do you think? It's a great question. I, you know, to, to piggyback what Kristen was saying, it's never going to be one size fits all because every movie, although we can classify a movie like, oh, this is like that movie, this is like that, every movie is unique to its own. So, you know, when you talk about the 17 day window, I want to see a big studio give a 17 day window to a guaranteed grand slam on the film that would 100%, you know, do over $100 million in the box office. So until I see that, I think it is temporary, um, you know, a lot of these announcements until the theaters have their leverage back. With that said, uh, to answer the, the specific question, I don't think it's holding on. You know, I know this, as I get older, I need bigger and bigger screens, and I wear glasses and I go to the eye doctor every two years. <laughs> I think the older audience is always going, you know, assuming there's a vaccine and people are comfortable, the older audience like myself is, is predominantly always going to prefer to get out of the house and go see a movie in a theater. I don't think that will ever change, um, you know, for, for a long time. So I don't think it's about holding on to an old model like Kodak. I think it's just about the kind of films that get kind of that art house theatrical. It's just about kind of, uh, you know, finding the right films that, that fit that. So I, I don't think it's just holding on to the- You need to, to jump on that though, Beck. I think that there's such like a desire for community right now. I think coming out of this and all of us being just on our own for the next like year or two, I think there'll be a resurgence once film theaters open safely. I think people are hungry to, to have that kind of experience and go back to a more traditional release. But then I think you make an, an excellent point about the older, that older audience, that traditional art house audience, they, they will always go to the theater, I think, but they also will be the last ones to feel safe, I think, going back into yeah. a theatrical yeah. setting. Yeah. That, that's so, maybe, so true. The, maybe the independent theaters need to start, you know, their own health insurance. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Kurt, Kurt, I yeah. want to bring you in. I want to bring you in on this conversation. Um, so community really, really important. So what do you think? Are we holding on to an outda outdated model? No, again, I mean, I think that, um, you know, obviously there's theaters now that are shut. They've already thrown in the towel. They're shut to the end of the year because, again, they have an older core audience and it's just not worth, uh, you know, the risk for, in terms of health and financially. But 
again, I just go back to, I'm not in the, my business, I'm not in the traditional business of following, you know, certain windows. I've been in this crazy world of experimenting my whole life. <laughs> like with, in terms of, I do, like I said, a lot, I just try to do things that will monetize films to the highest level and work with film. A lot of times we don't even follow a so-called like studio model, right? So I think independent theaters, if they see something that's working, and my point being is theaters, um, you know, if you do something where you're going to do like a, like a, you're going to bring in like uh, uh, electric cars for a, a drive-in appreciation day um, and you're going to hold like a party or whatever and it and sells out a screen, I think theaters are, again, are going to have um, the ability to, once they open, they're going to do, you know, one night only type of screenings. They're going to do traditional releases. They're going to do things that, I mean, right now, what theaters are doing is they're holding more private screenings than actual releases. So you can like rent out a theater, right, to, to watch a film. But even internationally, you know, certain theaters, um, like for example, in Ireland, right, they had, you could do 50, 50 people per, per, per screening. And then just yesterday, they, they pulled the rug from underneath these theaters. Now it's down to six six people per screening. So it's like, I mean, no one knows because it's just so crazy. Australia, you know, again, they're, they're happy. They're, they're, they're rolling along except, you know, places like in uh, Melbourne, right? So it's just, everything's all over the place. So I think traditional, to answer your question, I don't think anyone's holding on to one particular way of doing things. I think people just don't know. I think people are just trying to survive, trying to come up with different types of models. But I think that's the beauty of it. I think we have to be more open-minded in terms of our approach towards product, right? Towards films, treating them like brands, right? How do you expand beyond just the traditional windows? Like how do you create a brand that is going to push all of these revenue streams up? So, I mean, there's a, that's a whole nother conversation, but I just think again, our brains have to work in a very different way uh, in today's world, yeah. in the independent world. Well, unfortunately, I think we're just about out of time, which is a real shame because we have some truly great questions. Uh, Kurt, Kristen, Beck, thank you so much. Jay, Jim, thank you for your great introductory presentation. Um, this has been a wonderful session, which I hope we get to repeat because as I say, I don't think we got to nearly half the questions that uh, we could have discussed today. And I guess we should hand it back to Eric. Eric, it's all yours. There we go. Thanks, uh, everyone. That was a terrific, uh, terrific panel. And um, yeah, we'd love to take you up on that if uh, I think you, you're interested in jumping back on at some point. Um, we'd, we'd love to have you. So thanks once again to our fabulous panel. Uh, and also, I want to thank everybody in our audience today. Thanks for jumping on with us um, to this edition of the webinar series from OTTX. As always, session was recorded and you'll be uh, able to watch it via the YouTube channel. Um, the, uh, that is the OTTX YouTube channel. Um, PowerPoint presentation is going to be available for OTTX members on our site at OTTX.org. I want to remind everybody about our upcoming events also. First, our flagship event, the OTTX Summit Market and Conference and more. It's just around the corner, less than two weeks away on September 1st to the 3rd. We've uh, got a jam-packed event with incredible presentations, informative workshops, business meetings, and an exhibitor hall. Of course, we have the traditional happy hour networking sessions to close out each day. So everyone who is anyone's going to be there, you're not going to want to miss that. After, our, um, after that, our next series in the Wednesday webinar series is a presentation from Third Eye Digital. Um, High dynamic range, UHD, and immersive audio in the OTTH. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, as always, you can register for this and other OTTX sessions on our website at OTTX.org. I'm also going to drop the links into the chat right now so you can hop over there and register right after the event. So with that, um, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today and uh, hope everybody's enjoying your Wednesday and we'll talk with you all soon. Thanks, Eric. Thanks.